Hello everybody, I'm John Carter and uh, today's lecture or talk is on uh, John Adams and his influence on American constitutional government, uh, particularly his, in his influence on the Massachusetts Constitution and then the U.S. Constitution. So um, I have my, my talk is divided up into several parts here. First, uh, uh, the, the purpose of, of the talk is to try to explain how Adams and his thinking helped influence the development of the Massachusetts Constitution and then the U.S. Constitution. And there are four basic principles that are involved in his efforts that I wanted to highlight. I'll, I'll take a look, we'll take a look at that in a minute. Give you a brief biography of Adams. Take a look at two of his most important essays on the topic, Thoughts on Government and A Defense of the Constitutions of the Governments of the United States. Then take a look at the 1780 Massachusetts Constitution and then the U.S. Constitution and try to wrap it all up and show how Adams was able to influence uh, many of the principles that we find in these two documents. Okay. So, uh, Besides Adams's influence, on, particularly on the Massachusetts and the U.S. Constitution, I also wanted to, to just touch upon the, the broader uh, explanation or broader emphasis on the historical and philosophical development of our constitutions in this country. So, what are these? What are these four uh, significant points or principles that Adams uh, illustrates here? First off is the need for a virtuous citizenry. He was very much uh, concerned about the character of the citizenry and how it would support free government. Secondly is the rule of law, the importance of the law being impartially executed, impartially applied to all. The third point is the importance of popular sovereignty. The idea that only legitimate governments could o only rest it on the consent of the governed. And finally, the separation of powers, the separation of the different functions of government in the different uh, areas so that they would not be able to combine and, and violate rights. Okay, but before we get into that, just want to give a brief biography on Adams. He was born in 1735 in Braintree, Massachusetts, which is a small town about uh, 10 miles down the coast from Boston on the Massachusetts Bay. Um, he married Abigail Smith and had five children. He was a lawyer, a farmer, a statesman, and of course the President of the United States. Um, he had quite a reputation for being a man of principle, uh, a man of uh, great intellect and capability. Um, and he developed these, uh, he, and, and as a consequence of, of his reputation, he was offered uh, a position at the Court of the Admiralty in the early 1770s, and he quickly, um, he quickly denied that or returned that offer down because it was at a time of great turmoil in Boston. The British troops were occupying the city, and he felt uh, it, it would, he did not want to do something that went against the, the sentiment of the time. And that would have been greatly uh, against the sentiment against the, um, the British occupation. And he was, he was a man of principle. He knew it would be a great opportunity for him personally, but he was concerned about aligning himself with the British. But another important reputation builder for Adams, and it illustrates once again his, his desire, his, his, he valued it, principles over self-interest at all times. Um, he defended the officers and men accused of murder after the Boston Massacre. And he was the only one who would take the case. And he successfully defended the officer in charge and the enlisted men uh, two of the enlisted men were found guilty of manslaughter, but uh, he was overall very successful in their defense. And once again, it illustrates his value of principle over self-interest. He thought it was very important that people uh, earned a fair trial, received a fair trial, and had a right to counsel, so he took the case. Um, and then he, was, he moved into Massachusetts politics after that, did a, a stint in the Massachusetts State Assembly, and then was asked to be a delegate to both the First and Second Continental Congresses. And this is where he established more of a national reputation as he connects with prominent men from all over the, the colonies uh, 
and uh, he becomes known as the great defender of natural rights, liberty, and self-governance. Okay. Thoughts on government. Thoughts on government is a very important essay he wrote in uh, the spring of 1776. Uh, at this time, hostilities, open armed hostilities have already begun against the British. Lexington and Concord was a year earlier. Um, and so things were already moving towards uh, a break from Britain. And uh, this is his thoughts on government essay was just an illustration of some of the ideas that were floating around at the time that became very influential and very prominent. Uh, what does he say here in his essay? He says the just purpose of government is social happiness. Okay, that's the purpose of government. And the only way you can achieve this social happiness is with a virtuous citizenry. A citizenry who understands the importance of self-restraint, um, humility, uh, sub subjecting your own self-interest to a higher interest, a common good. This uh, must is crucial to, uh, to the happiness of society. And he also wrote in this essay that he thought he, this could be nurtured, that virtue in the citizenry could be nurtured. Okay? The second important point in this essay is the impartial and exact execution of laws. And to understand this, you can, you can see why this was so important. If you look a few months ahead, when the Declaration of Independence is written and published, one of the main themes in the indictment against the king was how the law was not being impartially applied and executed. A couple of examples. Uh, the judges, the king's judges were beholden to the king alone for their offices. They relied on the king for their salaries and for continuance in office. So the question becomes how can these judges impartially apply the law? The second important point here is the the British soldiers were quartered in, uh, in Boston homes and they were not subject to the law, the local law. If they were accused of a crime, they would be sent back to Great Britain for trial. And this again was uh, a great affront to the principle of impartial executional laws. There is not supposed to be a, a second standard or two standards for applying the laws. It ought to apply equally to all. The third point in his thoughts on government is the importance of popular sovereignty. The consent of the governed is the foundation of all just governments. And it was important that, uh, that the people who did serve as elected officials were wise and just men. Uh, they had the power deputed to them by the, uh, by the populace through elections. The institutional structure, the fourth point here, is very important. Uh, separation of powers. He, he expresses the need for a bicameral legislature, not a single representative body because it would be caught up in its battles with the executive, but a bicameral legislature which would share power and would have a, be in better position to um, guard the rights of the citizenry. The executive would be chosen out of the uh, legislative branch and the judiciary would be independent uh, and would serve, the justices would serve at, at uh, times of good behavior, which essentially meant that they could serve for life. Um, how, he does not explain how these judges would be, would be selected in this essay. And finally, part of the structure is frequent elections, um, annual elections. And the idea was that you would go, you would leave your profession or your trade, you would go to serve in the legislature for a certain period of time, and then you would go back, uh, go back to your profession or your trade. He, uh, he used this, uh, this idea of the, the bubbles rising to the top, and, uh, and then they would break and fall back into the water. So that's the idea that you would go back to the uh, society and you would have to live under the laws that you had written. So this places a heavy burden on the sovereign, uh, on, the, on the citizenry, right? The citizenry are supposed to be virtuous, they're supposed to be judicious in who they pick to, uh, to represent them in the legislative assembly. So um, the, the idea was that a virtuous citizenry, just and wise men in the legislature would be able to cultivate and develop uh, 
these political virtues that were necessary, such as humili humility, patience, and moderation, all so that they would be resistant to temptations of power. Okay, so that's thoughts on government, 1776. Eleven years later, the war had been won, the, the newly independent states had been operating under the Articles of Confederation, um, and there was uh, great concern among many Americans that the Articles were not operating very well, or they were not suited to the conditions anymore. It was essentially a treaty of independent states, and the U.S. Congress that operated under the Articles had no uh, real authority. They could not levy taxes without the state's consent. They could not conduct foreign policy. There was, there was very little that the U.S. Congress could do uh, under the Articles of Confederation, and there were many in America who thought that they needed to be significantly revised. Um, so in this context, in the spring of 1787, um, Adams writes this defense of the constitutions of the United States, and it's a defense of the kind of constitutional philosophy of America, not of any, any particular constitution, but of a constitutional philosophy. And here he, he addresses the, uh, similar points to thoughts on government, but his view of human nature becomes much darker. And he, he looks at human beings as being interested only in themselves and interested in domineering others. It's a far more pessimistic view uh, than the essay he wrote in Thoughts on Government. Um, here there is a high concern for rights, especially property rights. During this period, there was a great concern that interested collect political collections would take over state governments, state legislatures, and vote into, into being laws that were detrimental to property rights. Uh, for example, in Rhode Island, the legislature was taken over by uh, small farmers and artisans, and they instituted a paper money system. And this is a wonderful uh, way of trying to water down the debts that you owe. And uh, many Americans thought that this was a uh, usurpation of property rights because you lend money to people, you ought to get back that money uh, in return at, at least as or greater value than you lent it. And when you float lots of paper money, it reduces the value of what you are using to, to pay back your, your loans. So there's a much greater emphasis on property rights. Once again, we see a separation of power scheme in his defense. And then um, the recognition of the popular sovereignty once again, but um, a more explicit recognition of the need to limit popular sovereignty. Okay? The, the, your elected representatives cannot do whatever they want. They must be constrained by our natural rights and our property rights. So that's a, a brief overview of the defense of the constitutions of the United States in 1787. Adams was not in the country during the Constitutional Convention of Philadelphia. He was representing uh, the U.S. in the Court of St. James in Great Britain. Uh, but this is, um, but his, he, these are some of the points that you'll see come up in the U.S. Constitution when we look at that. Right. Very briefly, Adams had come back by 1779 and participated in the writing of the Massachusetts Constitution. It, um, uh, it was mainly written by Adams. He was, the, he was the greatest force involved. But in his preamble, you can see the influence of his earlier essays and uh, you can see the likeness with the U.S. Constitution. If I may quote from the preamble of the, this is the Massachusetts Constitution, he says, the end of the institution, maintenance, and administration of government is to secure the existence of the body politic to protect it and to furnish the individuals who compose it with the power of enjoying in safety and tranquility their natural rights and the blessings of life. And whenever these great objects are not obtained, the people have a right to alter the government and to take measures necessary for their safety, prosperity, and happiness. So there you see, you'll see that some of those themes echoed in the U.S. Constitution, but you can also see his views on the purpose of government is to uh, ensure rights and to protect the ability of people to pursue happiness.
The first part of the Massachusetts State Constitution is a Declaration of Rights. And uh, you, when, if you look at the, we're not going to go into those in any detail, but if you look at them, you will see them echo once again in other state constitutions or in the U.S. Bill of Rights, which is eventually ratified after the Constitution is. Secondly is the frame of government. Again, very similar to um, the essays that he wrote where there's a separation of power scheme. There are, there's a judiciary which is appointed for life. There is a bicameral legislature and there is a governor now who is not chosen by the legislature but directly elected by the people. Um, so that's an a interesting change to the framework that he laid out earlier. A couple of miscellaneous items I'd like to call your attention to. One is the encouragement of education. It was the government's responsibility to encourage education and aim towards the virtue of the citizenry to understand the just purposes of government. So here again is an echo of, of his writings and thoughts on government. It was, it, it was a public responsibility to make sure its citizenry was equipped to govern itself. And finally, the writ of habeas corpus. This is the requirement that if you are accused of a crime, the accusation must be made in front of a magistrate, and you must know the charges against you. Um, this is something that was so important to the colonists of the, or the Americans of the day. It was included in the body of the U.S. Constitution and was considered a bedrock principle of how the laws are to be faithfully um, and impartially executed. Once again, okay. So finally we get to the U.S. Constitution and the features are in common with Massachusetts ought to be quite evident, the separation of power scheme in particular. But also look at how the principles um, illustrated in Adams' writing are, are, are shown here once again in the U.S. Constitution. If you look at the preamble, what, what is the purpose of government? Uh, we, are, we are forming this uh, this effort to form a more perfect union and to ensure domestic tranquility. So the purpose of the government is to provide the conditions under which people may pursue their happiness. Secondly, the sovereignty of the people, we the people, is, is how the preamble to the Constitution begins. Um, so again, it's, it is a popular sovereignty upon which just government rests. Certainly the separation of power scheme that we've seen in the Massachusetts Constitution and explained by Adams in his writing. The, the U.S. government is divided into three branches. The legislative branch is once again divided between the House and the Senate, each with its own powers and prerogatives. The judges serve it for life, um, and the president is elected by the people, indirectly, but still based on uh, the vote of the people in the, in, in the states, which is then transmitted to the Electoral College. And finally, the rule of law. Although there is not any specific article that points to the principle of the rule of law as, as overarching, but the whole structure, the whole uh, framework of the Constitution is aimed towards this idea that the rule of law must prevail. It is not to be a government of men. It's not to be subject to the whims of men. It is subject to the rule of law, basic principles which are laid down and established and then enlivened by a virtuous, uh, educated citizenry. So there, there you have a, a little, a brief summary of the role of John Adams in forming the ideas to. Um, that informed not only the development of the Massachusetts Constitution, a, a deeper look into this topic would show his influence on other state constitutions, and certainly the U.S. Constitution. So I hope you appreciated these, uh, th this talk, and, um, uh, and, and, and we'll, hopefully it will, um, it will engender a further enthusiasm to, to, seek, uh, to seek out more uh, knowledge and understanding of the principles behind the U.S. Constitution.